to everyone for joining us. My name is McKenna and I'm the tour and membership coordinator here at Historic Milwaukee. For those of you who might be unfamiliar with Historic Milwaukee, we're a nonprofit organization and we're dedicated to increasing awareness of Milwaukee's history, architecture and preservation. We organize events like Doors Open and Spaces and Traces each year. We typically host these book talks right in our office and we can usually only accommodate about 20 people. So one of the perks of having these virtual talks is that now there's almost 100 people watching the book talk today, so that's awesome. So I hope you enjoy the presentation and I'm happy to introduce Jennifer Billock. She is an award-winning culinary travel journalist, best-selling author and editor. So now I'm gonna pass it along to Jennifer and she can get started with her presentation. Thank you. Hi everybody, thanks for coming today. Um, just have a quick presentation to go through some things about the book and then some stuff you'll find inside and then we'll open it up to questions. So the book is Classic Restaurants of Milwaukee. The slide right now has the cover, which I absolutely love. So <laughs> I, hope, uh, I hope you like it too. <laughs> um, so the book has about 150 restaurants in it. I had whittled that number down from about 400 suggestions and ideas of my own. Um, so it was quite the process to get the selection of books include, that are included. I kind of went with ones that have a lot of relevance to the history of Milwaukee um, and are more cherished. So some, some of the newer ones in the book, like the Bartolotta restaurants um, and the Coffee Trader, they have a, like, not they have a newer history, but they're, they're really meaningful to the city. So I thought it was important to include things like that as well. Um, so it's broken into several chapters. I've got breakfast, lunch, dinner, desserts, and drinks. And then at the end is about 20 vintage recipes from restaurants, which is my favorite part of the book because, because I love to, to cook. Um, and it, it kind of brings me back to a few of the places and the food that, that people have had there. So the restaurants were taken from my own research and my own experience um, just dining out in Milwaukee and also suggestions from others. Some friends had some ideas and then the old Milwaukee group was really helpful. Um, so I was able to get a lot of information from that to make that huge list that I mentioned before. And there are nearly 200 photos in it and those are collected from historical societies, from personal collections, from restaurant owners. Um, someone sent me in the mail a paper menu for a booster's limb of the gold which was just great um so I got pictures and and items from everywhere uh that people wanted to share for the book so that was a lot of fun to help me put it together um so I wanted to share some stories and some places about um some places that are in the book so the first one is coffee trader uh, coffee Trader was actually a shop selling just coffee beans when it first started out. It wasn't actually like a, the coffee shop and restaurant area that everybody knew it as. Um, and it opened, it opened as the iteration that everyone knew in 1975. And according to local legend, they had the first espresso machine in Milwaukee, which was pretty cool, right? So now there's there's this way to go and get like all of your espresso drinks <laughs> that you couldn't get before if you even knew that they existed, right? Um, so it became popular immediately, partially because of that espresso machine, but also because you could just hang out there forever and nobody would kick you out. You could just kind of sit there and have a good time and, and talk and drink and, you know, just enjoy yourself. And it got so popular that celebrities came by. I think Robin Williams visited. Um, and then I'm not sure which other ones, but um, Robin Williams really sticks out in my head. They also hosted themed events. Um, Kieran O'Brien, he lives in Bayview, I think he did a lot of artwork for the coffee traders events and things like that. So this was for a t-shirt, this design was. Um, and he drew it and he so nicely let me into his house to go into his basement and take pictures of everything that he you know, had prepared for Coffee Trader, which was super nice. So like I said, everybody was really great when I was working on this book. Um, so Coffee Trader closed in the 90s, 
overall, people said it was because the food was mediocre and the service wasn't great. Uh, but it was still, you know, a much beloved place. And it's still, there's a Facebook group that is kind of keeping the memory of it alive. Um, oops, sorry, I went to the wrong slide. Well, I'll come to that next. So there's a Facebook group for it um, that you can join. I believe it's called Remembering the Coffee Trader on Downer Avenue or something like that. So look that up if you're into it. There's a lot of people still getting, get, getting together there and virtually hanging out. Um, so next is the Oriental Pharmacy Tea House, or as most people just knew it, Oriental Drugs. Um, its heyday was in the 1980s, and people loved it because it kind of brought in, you know, all walks of life in Milwaukee, and it was a traditional thing for families. So people went there with their parents, they went there with their grandparents, and they just developed this big sense of community around the lunch counter there. And the great thing about it well, one of the great things about it is that the owner was so thoughtful, you know, he never turned anybody away, even if they couldn't pay for their food. So if you were hungry and you needed a meal and you went to the lunch counter, you got it. And I think that is just such a wonderful thing. So there is actually a sculpture made of the lunch counter at the Oriental Pharmacy Tea House. And that was made by Adolf Rosenblatt. It's currently on display at a museum in Madison. And the thing that I like about this sculpture is that first of all, it's huge. So you can get up and like walk around it. Um, and there, the artist would sit next to you at the lunch counter and sculpt your face and what you were doing as you were sitting there. So it was kind of like just sitting there, you're eating your lunch and somebody was staring at you, making a piece of art out of you know, whatever you were doing. And then he had a reception for the regulars of the tea house who, when they first decided to show the art piece, so they could go and see like their clay doppelgangers um, and just, you know, get that experience all over again. So the, the Oriental Pharmacy Tea House had a really interesting menu. Um, and the one that I found online did not have this menu item on it, but I found out about it through the old Milwaukee group. It was called Shrimp Shapes. And Shrimp Shapes was <laughs> bits of chopped up seafood that were formed into a shrimp shape and fried. So there was not, as far as I know, any actual shrimp in the shrimp shapes, but it was a pretty much, uh, it was a pretty well loved dish uh, at the tea house. The Oriental Pharmacy Tea House closed in 1995. It's now the Crossroads Collective Food Hall, and they have the old cash register from the lunch counter. Um, and the owners of the food hall said that everything about it was kind of inspired by Oriental drugs. So they wanted to get that same kind of feel there, and they've got some other memorabilia um, from the lunch counter there in addition to the cash register. So next is White Tower. White Tower, I love the story of because it is basically a huge ripoff of White Castle. So shortly after White Castle started, um, White Tower opened and the owners actually studied White Castle to replicate the success of the fast food chain. They went into White Castle and measured the floor plan. They <laughs> used the same architecture and color scheme. So everything was white and stainless steel. It looked like a little castle. Um, they had the same menu prices. They had the same burger style. They even poached employees to come over and work there and tell them if they were doing things the same way that White Castle did it. Um, and they also used a similar slogan. So White Castle's slogan was buy and buy the sack and White Tower's slogan was take home a bag full. So by 1930, White Tower was eclipsing White Castle, and it became one of the largest burger chains in the country. Predictably, White Castle did not like that. So in 1929, they sued White Tower. Um, so, I mean, obviously, wouldn't, why wouldn't they, you know? <laughs> so White Tower had to pay an $80,000 licensing fee to White Castle, um, and then they were required to change all of their designs. And so every time they change a design though, they had to send the plans to the executives at White Castle so they could review it and make sure that it was like far enough 
away from the White Castle design. But the problem was <laughs> the problem was that White Tower changed their design to be like a the in fashion art deco type style that was popular then. And it only made them more popular, which I imagine made White Castle even more angry. Um, but White Tower eventually closed in 1976. It was strategically placed. The locations were strate strategically placed at streetcars and crosswalks, just places where people would gather. Um, and once they built the expressways that kind of stopped being such a beneficial location for them, I guess. Um, so they closed. And as we know, White Castle is still going strong. Okay, next is the public natatorium. The public natatorium is absolutely fascinating to me. So in the late 1880s, Milwaukee opened a series of public natatoriums and those are indoor pools. So most houses when they open still didn't have indoor plumbing. So people would go to these public natatoriums to bathe, to shower, to, to just swim in the pool that was there and just kind of hang out. But as plumbing started to get better throughout the city, the public natatoriums started to close. Um, the last one closed in 1977. And then two years later, this one, which I believe was on 4th Street, opened in, it, it turned into a restaurant and it opened in 1979. But it was not just like a restaurant on its own. They turned the pool into a dolphin pool. So they brought in two dolphins and a trainer from Florida and they had dinner and a dolphin show. So you would go and they did five dolphin shows a night. You would eat your dinner in these tables surrounding the pool or up on the balcony surrounding the pool area. Um, and you could like help with the dolphin show. Like some people got up to go like feed the dolphins and pet them on the head and stuff like that. Uh, but it, it opened to a bit of controversy because of animal, animal rights, obviously, like who you're keeping dolphins captive in a dinner restaurant, there's going to be some issues, but people still loved it. Um, but it only lasted for six years, I think. So it closed in 1985. And that is for a couple reasons. First, they were just hemorrhaging money. <laughs> they were going bankrupt. It was owned by the owners of, um, it was owned by the garlic family who owned JJ Garlics. So they were spending so much money on dolphin care, on glasses, on the food, just everything. Like they went all out. I think the glasses themselves for, di for diners were $35 or $38 per glass. So if one broke, basically they're going to get kind of screwed over. And then they had to pay for the trainers and the food and the water management and things like that. Eventually there were allegations of animal abuse in addition to the bankruptcy because they didn't have the money to keep the pool up to the right temperature that it needed to be at. Um, so a, a couple of the dolphins got sick and they went to court. Um, but yeah, that it's just, it's such a terrible idea for a restaurant, but also just like such a fascinating part of restaurant history in Milwaukee. Um, next is Giovanni's. So Giovanni's sold classic Sicilian food and the reason that I am so interested in Giovanni's is because of the manager. The manager's name was Max Adonis, um, but that was actually a name that he adopted. So his original name is Max Ludwig Gajewski. And he, he was such a character. He was mouthy. He only had one arm. He chased people away if he didn't like how you looked. Like if you were coming up for a close parking spot and he didn't want you to park there. He would come out and like yell at you and make you go park somewhere else. So he though wanted to be in the mafia so bad <laughs> that he pretended to be Italian and changed his name to Max Adonis. He also tried to befriend mobsters and he bragged about his mob connections throughout the city. Um, so that is probably one of the reasons that he was eventually killed in 1989 in the restaurant, he was working, I think they had just closed and it was him and a member of the bar staff um, and people, two guys came in and 
just like straight out murdered him <laughs> and then they disappeared and it's still an unsolved mystery but um a few years later they found underneath a parking lot on the south side of milwaukee they found two bodies that had been buried under concrete that matched the description of what the waitress told the police were the killers and so it's you know half solved <laughs> i guess but it's it's kind of up in the air whether it was a mob kit mob hit or a drug deal because he was also into that um but he was yeah an interesting interesting character <laughs> so next when talking about serbian food um there's a chapter in the book called from the homeland and that talks about all of the different um like ethnic foods in the city so there's the Serbian, German, there's pizza and Italian, there's all the great stuff. So Serbian, the two big Serbian food restaurants in Milwaukee are Three Brothers and Old Town. And what I like about them is that they're both owned by the same family, which I didn't know um, before I started working on the book. So Three Brothers, um, which is the picture on the left, that opened in 1956 by, and I'm really sorry, I'm not gonna pronounce this name right, by Milun Radicevic after he had escaped a concentration camp during World War II. So during the Holocaust, he was separated from his children and he was eventually sponsored by a family in Milwaukee. So he moved to Milwaukee from Europe and opened this restaurant and he named it for his three sons. And he was hoping that having the restaurant would draw his family back, would draw his family to Milwaukee and they could all reunite there. And they did, which is great. So they all made it to Milwaukee the, um, between 1957 and 1958. All three boys came um, and then the entire family started to work at the restaurant. Um, it became known as their family's Ellis Island. So every visiting family member comes to the restaurant first to meet everybody. Um, it's currently, the restaurant's currently run by Maloon's granddaughter um and yeah so it's a really nice story of I mean it's got a tough beginning but it's it's such a great ending for them and the restaurant is still going it's delicious and the photo on the the right is the spinach and cheese barrack at Old Town Serbian Gourmet House so Old Town Serbian Gourmet House was opened by one of Maloon's sons in 1971. Um, it's still owned by his daughter. So the, both of the restaurants are still in the same family. Both of their food is delicious. Um, I could eat this barrack all day long. <laughs> and and I, I just, I hope you all go there because it's wonderful. So next I want to talk about German food. These are the big three, um, Mater's, John Ernst and Carl Ratch. Only Mater's is open now though, the other two have closed. So Mater's is Milwaukee's oldest restaurant. It opened in 1902. And something that I like about it is that it served the first legal beer in Milwaukee after prohibition ended. Um, so they had, when prohibition started, they had put up a sign that said something to the effect of right now we have cold beer, tomorrow we'll only have the lake. So they, uh, during Prohibition, they focused on their food offerings to try and keep business up. But, um, and so then by the time Prohibition ended, people wanted the food in addition to the beer. So that, you know, kept customers coming. Um, sorry, I'm lost in my notes. <laughs> so the current look of the restaurant, uh, Never mind. <laughs> Sorry. So the restaurant, you know, it's been through so much, right? It, it's been through the depression. It's been through World War. It's been through the prohibition. Um, in during World War II, they remodeled the restaurant because they wanted to downplay the German theme um, because they thought that it was going to hurt business, obviously. Um, so they turned it into a kind of like a German estate from what was basically like a glass storefront. Um, I honestly, I feel like it moved more in a German direction, but I, I, I wasn't around then. So I don't know necessarily for sure what it looked like if there was an interim between the glass storefront and the estate castle type thing it is now. 
So Mater's is still in the same family. I think it's on the fifth generation of ownership. Um, before Mater's became the oldest restaurant in Milwaukee, John Ernst had that designation. So John Ernst opened in 1878 and it served old world German specialties until it closed in 2001. Carl Ratches opened in 1904 and it became famous pretty quickly. People loved the Christmas knickknacks that were out year round. They loved the paper tablecloths that were on the tables. But all of that was removed in 2016 by a new owner who wanted to kind of um, not class up the joint, I guess. He wanted to bring in a younger crowd or modernize it a little bit. Um, but people were mad and they stopped coming. They would, he said that they would walk in and see that the knickknacks were gone, the tablecloths were gone, and they would just turn around and leave. So people did not like the changes. Um, and so the restaurant abruptly closed in 2017 with just a sign on the door that said something along the lines of, we've served our last schnitzel. So, um, so now only Mater's remains. Okay, and I wanna talk about custard. Um, Leon's in particular, because Leon Schneider was such a big deal in the custard world in Milwaukee. So Leon's was opened in 1942 by Leon Schneider after he was the night manager at Gillis's Custard. So everybody knew him because he helped a lot of people get started. He would sign permits for people for their own custard stands. He scouted locations for people. He designed stands for them. He acquired and repaired equipment. He trained people in his own shop and then set them loose to manage their own place. So it was kind of like a management training program, I guess. Um, I think it was two weeks, but I'd have to be sure. So he would bring people in who wanted to open their own shop and he would teach them every single thing there was to know about running a custard stand. And then he would help them get their own stand and then they would go off and run theirs. And because custard is delicious, um, everybody pretty much was successful. So there's another Leon's in Oshkosh. It is not related to this Leon's. It used to be. So that Leon's was opened by a family member and they got into, he, he eventually sold it to someone unrelated and they got into an argument over whether or not Leon's should be able to sell fried food because the stand in Oshkosh wanted to sell fried food and the Leon's in Milwaukee said it would compromise the quality of the custard. So it turned into a whole big lawsuit um, and now the two are completely unrelated. <laughs> uh, okay. And then I wanted to go through some other fun stories that are in the book. So just a, a list of them are Goldman's lunch counter and the mystery of the missing lunch counter. So when Goldman's closed, the lunch counter basically disappeared and nobody knew where it was for several years. Um, and then it resurfaced in the 2000s um, and it's actually gonna be put into a bar, supposedly it's gonna be put into a bar by the guy that owns um, at random. So that story is in there. There's the Watts Tea Room story and, it, um, and its abrupt closure, which they said it wouldn't close and then suddenly it was closed and people were mourning the sunshine cake, which thankfully the recipe for the sunshine cake is in the book. So you can make your own. Suburbia has a great story of tax evasion and a lawsuit based around spices and the original owner breaking into new locations to try and, you know, steal the business away from the people that were running it. It's, it's a, a really interesting story. Um, so Snugs, Snugs was a mafia headquarter type place and they had, they had a, a takedown of a mafia family there um, that su it surrounded the use of a bright red telephone that was tucked into a back booth and the FBI had created this entire fake birthday party, like complete with a fake photographer and fake guests and fake, just fake everything to try and get a hold of this phone to, to prove that there was some mob business happening there. Um, Cardaro Club is Milwaukee's first pizzeria. There's a good story about that. Um, John Hawk's Pub has a fun story of a couple 
that used to go there every year for their anniversary. And when it closed, they had the booth actually removed from the restaurant and installed into their house. So they can still go and sit in that booth every year for their anniversary. Um, the harp had an Irish wake uh, when the, when the restaurant had to change locations and it was a parade of 200 some people down the street in Milwaukee to go from the old location to the new location. <clears throat> and Von Trier has a murder mystery also attached to it, um, like some of the other restaurants in the book. But this one was unique because the owner was murdered by a bow and arrow. So he got to his house at, I want to say two in the morning and someone shot him with a bow and arrow and killed him. And he like crawled his way up the stairs to talk to his neighbors and call for help and try to like say who did it. But it like all of his, like it never turned out. So it it's still unsolved. There is some conjecture about who actually did it. Um, and you can find that in the book as well. And then I wanted to go through some pictures that didn't make it into the book that I particularly like. And there were a few of them in the, in the presentation as well, but these ones I wanted to call out specifically. So on the left is Gloriosa's very first store. And I love that it's got the truck in front. Um, and I think that's, a, yeah, it's got, it's got the truck in front. It's a cool old truck. Um, and on the right is Gillis's in the 1940s. And you can see how popular it was with, um, you know, local teens and military and everybody like that. Um, they were always, always crowded, always lines out the door. Um, and then here we've got this beautiful bakery sign. I just, I love signs like this with the lights and it, it's, I don't know, it's great. <laughs> and then the Mark's big boy sign. Um, and then the third one is the line out the door at George Webb. And I, I'm not sure if this was an opening day for one of the George Webb locations or if they were doing a special promotion, but um, yeah, it's, it was so popular that, <laughs> that the lines out the door, there's still George Webb's though. So you can go and see it and go and taste the food yourself. Um, and then this last photo is a picture of the sunshine cake from the tea room. It looks delicious. Um, and then we have Palermo Villa, which is owned by, or was owned by the Palermo Pizza Dynasty, <laughs> I guess. Um, and then here is this salad bar in Captain Steak Joint that was shaped like a ship. And I, this is the coolest salad bar I have ever seen. So <laughs> if I could have one like it, in my house, I would have it because, I mean, look at it. It's so cool. And Captain Steak Joint was like a pioneer of salad bar technology. Just, um, they, I think, they were, I don't remember exactly what it was. It's, it's all in the book, but um, they, they started some technology that other restaurants picked up, um, but they did not include the ship-shaped salad bar. <laughs> So that is it. I will stop sharing my screen and we can go to questions. Great, thank you so much. I love all the stories you shared and I like how some of them like really make you wanna look into the book and learn more about them. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, I'm a little anxious. <laughs> <laughs> Even though it's on Zoom, it's like st I'm still presenting in front of tons of people. Yeah. <laughs> So first I'm going to go through, we have a few um, like fun comments. So Kathy said about Giovanni's that we took guests from England for dinner there in one of the last weeks they were serving. We wanted to see the historic building and its new use. So that's really cool. That's cool. And um, another comment about George Webb's, I think they're referring to um, Big Lion might have been when they had the free burger promotion after the oh. Brewers won 12 games in a row. Yeah, so the great thing about that is that they, <laughs> George Webb made this promise that when the, the when they won that certain amount of games in a row, they would give free burgers to everybody, but it didn't happen for like 40 years or something. <laughs> so, but they held true to the promise and they still do it. Like it, it happened, um, Oh, not that long ago, but they still, everybody got free burgers. So I think it's great that they have maintained that 
throughout their history. Yeah, that's awesome. Such a Milwaukee thing. <laughs> <laughs> and um, someone else said, oh, Kate said, I love Old Town. The photo of Burrick is making my mouth water, which we can all relate to. It is so good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, gonna go through some questions. So from the beginning, um, Karen asked, why was Oriental Drugs called a tea house? I am not 100% sure. My assumption is that it was because it was the Oriental Pharmacy and that mm -hmm. was appropriate <laughs> for yeah. the theme, I guess. If someone else knows a, a better response, I would love to know the answer to that. Awesome, okay, and then Another comment, um, Kristen says, so many things I never knew or knew to appreciate about a town that was only two hours from where I grew up. Yeah, oh, there's a lot. There's a lot. <laughs> and um, I think a few questions about snugs. So people were asking, is it named after a mobster or is there like a mob relationship? Um, I know the mob owned it. I don't think it was named after a specific mobster. I, I could be wrong, but I, I don't think so. I think it was because it was like a, like a cozy place. Mm -hmm. Like with, in feel. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Snuggly. Okay. And then um, this might not be part of the book, but someone asked what happened to the national liquor bar sign? I, I don't know. I feel like I saw something in On Milwaukee about it recently, um, but I'm not 100% sure of what happened to it. Yeah, I think that would be a good question um, for Adam Levin. Yeah, I think he would know. <laughs> he knows everything. <laughs> yeah, all the old signs, um, he would definitely have the answer for that. And Shelly says, great presentation. Gwen asked, is Heinemann's in the book? Heinemann's is in the book, yeah. Great, yeah, and I put a link in the chat for anyone who's interested. You can buy the book there. Yeah, I like what I like about Heinemann's is that when they were closing their locations, like, people were making pilgrim pilgrimages to each location as it closed. So my Heinemann's closed. I'm going to go to that Heinemann's. <laughs> that Heinemann closed. I'm going to go to the next Heinemann's. Like, oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> And Eric asked, what are your favorite top three existing places in the book? Mm, well, Mater's definitely. I've got a lot of nice memories um, of Mater's. My, my parents love it. And we go and get the giant pretzel and sit in the big chair. <laughs> and, um, Solly's is in the book. Um, they have excellent burgers. The owner is super nice. It's just, it's the same like lunch counter feel. So I really like that a lot. That's, that's a... Uh, Nice place to go. Um, and then any of the custard places. I like Gillis's because I lived closest to Gillis's. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but uh, they're all great. <laughs> oh, and I like Gillis's. They, um, one of the points I make in the book is that a lot of people pronounce it Gillies, but that's not mm -hmm. correct. It's, it's actually Gillis's with the, like the apostrophe at the end and they have oh, like a, yeah. And they have to train employees to say the name, right? And wow. have, it's like, they have like a, a swear jar where if you say it wrong, you got to put in a dollar. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. okay, and Steve said, I remember when the English room downstairs in the Fister was the place to be. Yeah, the English room is in there as well, along with a photo of a chef, I think, who taught taught people uh, taught the wait staff how to make certain things table side. So, um, oh, um, someone asked, did you cover Dutchland Dairy? Is that in the book? It is in the book. It's not in the presentation, so you didn't miss it, but but it is in the book. Yeah, along with the uh, pretty epic theme song. <laughs> And someone else who came in a little bit late asked if we talked about snugs, and you did. Briefly, yeah. Um, and I did record this, so if anyone wants to watch it after, you can feel free to email me to get that link. Oh, and someone did have the answer, um, the liquor bar sign. It's in Heaven City in Maguanago. So I oh, guess I'll cool. still make a little road trip and go see it. Yeah. Um, do you have any stories you'd like to share about the Shorecrest Hotel and Sally Papia? Yeah, so Sally's is in the book. Um, 
I, I'm pretty sure it's Sally's. Let me, I've got my flagged copy here. So <laughs> let me try and find it real quick. Cause Sally's was an interesting story about mob ties there as well. And here it is. Um, there was a, there was a, an un, like a mysterious car accident that caused Sally's death. So she, <laughs> she went to prison for mob things, um, for extortion and conspiracy. And then Sally's steakhouse closed when she got out of prison, but then she started working at the Savoy room. Um, and it was coincidentally, the restaurant was owned by her former lawyer for the case that got her sent to jail. So, <laughs> um, and he was also um, in the mob family. Um, so in 2005, though, she had a very mysterious death. She had a very like tenuous relationship with her daughter and the two of them were driving, um, driving <laughs> in a car together. Sally was the passenger and they don't really know why, but her daughter drove off the road and head first into a tree and they both died. So oh my gosh, not hundred percent sure what the situation was, but it's kind of a mysterious mysterious death <laughs> wow very mysterious um a few other questions about restaurants if they're in the book um mm -hmm. i would say to everyone you can come look at historic milwaukee if you want to look at the book um we'd love for you to check it out yourself but quickly um do you include keggles in in the book yeah keggles in is in the book and it's that's such a cool story about uh, i see the comment from diane mm -hmm. that it was a speakeasy and it's uh, the the woman the wife made spe she sewed special pockets into her outfit so that she could hide liquor and then there was like a button that you would push that would flip open a trap door and she would go down and get like that's where the alcohol store was so they uh they were raided by um i can't remember what they're called but the people who you know tried to catch you during prohibition oh so they were, yeah <laughs> they were raided and they lured the owner outside so that they could catch them with the trap door open it's just such a fascinating story wow yeah yeah it's so interesting all these things happen and a lot of these restaurants are still around like you can still go there yourself it's really yeah cool. Yeah. Well, and the other thing I love about Kegels is it's still owned by the Kegel family, but the current owner didn't know the restaurant was in his family because there was a huge family rift. And oh. so someone eventually contacted him about buying the place and he, mm -hmm. he didn't like, did not know that it was an asset that they had. Wow. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Going through these last few questions, I know you can see it on your end too. I think um, we've only missed was it Holly's or Follies for burgers? Sally's. S O L L Y. Oh, okay. Hey, That's see. what I that was about. It's it says Sally's. Oh, okay. if you can see that, yeah. And um, did you include Nicole's on Brady? I did not. No, I don't. I don't know that one. Okay, and then Albanese. River Al West Old Family uh, Run. Mm -mm. A lot of them I had to cut. Unfortunately, I had to cut because either I couldn't get pictures or I couldn't get um, people to talk to me about the history of the restaurants. Mm -hmm. Like some of them were just really difficult to get information yeah. about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you still found such a huge array of them, which is awesome. Um, and then one other one about the Velvet Chair. Is that in the book? It was a restaurant in the Performing Arts Center. No, it's not. I don't, I don't know that one. Okay, I think we went through all the questions. Oh, I see one about Pandals. Yes, Pandals is in the book as well. Great. Well, thank you everyone for tuning in, joining us for our virtual book talk. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. As I've learned something new for sure. I think everyone who's watching did. <laughs> and thank you so much for taking the time to answer the questions as well. Yeah, absolutely. And if you want to buy the book, it's available at Historic Milwaukee. Um, and yes. you should go visit them anyway, because they're great. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you again. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. Someone says, very interesting. Oh, thank, um, you. thank you, Jean. <laughs> okay, bye, everyone. Have a good right. night. Bye. Thanks, everybody.